Hey guys, welcome back to Father and Son Investing. This will be a very short video. We're going to talk about Nanox and what we know about where we're at and where will things be going. This is all in preparation for the Jeffries uh, Healthcare Conference presentation that Nanox will be doing at 10 a.m. Eastern Time tomorrow. We're going to base today's video off of the Berenberg Virtual Healthcare Conference that took place, oh, about two weeks ago. Uh, there were a few things in there that were new or updated. A lot of the stuff that he presented was stuff we've already seen before, so I won't rehash that. I thought some of the best part of that presentation was the question and answer period after his formal presentation where there were a number of very detailed questions that were asked, and he actually gave some detail to his answers. We're going to talk about that all in about five or six minutes, hopefully. First, let's talk about the tube. Now, if you're not familiar with the tube, remember that the Nanox innovation is being able to uh, create a cold cathode tube. And really the big innovation is putting uh, a chip into there that can make this all a digital process rather than an analog process. Go back and watch some of the previous videos that I've done if you want to know more about this tube and the chip and the way it works. Now, there was some discussion about glass uh, case for the x-ray tube versus a ceramic case. Uh, Mr. Poliakin did state that there is an Italian company called CEI. They have made x-ray tubes for more than 50 years and uh, they presented a schematic to Nanox to be able to make this uh, tube. Right now the cost is coming in at around $200. They're aiming for $100 per tube and based on my interpretation of what he said it sounded like the ceramic tube could come in at that $100. But he did say that in terms of their business model and expenses, $100 versus $200 was not a big deal. In the end, he said that they are agnostic regarding uh, glass versus ceramic. I think he probably meant that they're indifferent uh, regarding uh, that glass versus ceramic debate. All right, let's talk FDA, uh, the 510 clearance process. This isn't going well. They uh, still haven't chosen a predicate device to be able to make a 510 submission, a 510K submission to the FDA. Just to refresh our memory on how this 510K process goes, there's a predicate device that has to be chosen in order to use the 510K process for your submission. Essentially, the predicate device that's chosen has to be one that the FDA has already accepted and uh, needs to be similar enough that the FDA could use to accept this new device being submitted, in this case, the multi-source Nanox ARC. If it's a class one or class two device, then they go 510K. If it ends up being a class three device, then they have to do, go a totally different route. Nanox has not selected the predicate device yet that they're gonna compare their Nanox ARC to. They're way behind, way behind, way behind on this. This device, the predicate device, should have been chosen while they were still waiting for the single source. I am still encouraged by the technology behind this, uh, the leadership behind this, I'm uh, frustrated with. I, I think that uh, they need to get some people doing things faster. If it has taken them this long just to choose the predicate device, then perhaps there isn't one out there that's going to be similar enough for them and they're gonna to have to go a different route. Uh, that different route requires a much more in-depth uh, process and takes much more time. Now, Mr. Poliakin stated that they still expect that they will be able to submit this 510K clearance. He said, first he said uh, during the year, and then there was another part right after that where he said that it was soon, whatever that means. The CE clearance obviously has not been submitted. They're looking at the end of the year versus into next year to try to submit the CE clearance. That has to do with the European Union, uh, similar process, but European Union versus FDA. Let's just talk about the Nanox vision for 2030 and beyond. I found this part interesting. It sounded to me like he was trying to change the way the game is played to make it more advantageous for Nanox. I can't blame him for wanting to do that, but quite honestly, the uh, plan uh, I don't see that happening based upon the current status of medical imaging and how it is performed. Lastly, let's just wrap up by talking about tube capability. Uh, he did state that he thought that being able to produce 120 kVp, now when we're talking kVp, think of the 
power of an X-ray beam. Uh, when we talk about MA, think about the number of uh, X-ray beams going. So uh, we're not talking about the number of them, but the power, the penetrating power of them. He felt like 120 kVp would be sufficient for most of the procedures that they could perform with their Nanox Arc device. 120 kVp is pretty good for uh, thinner people. Uh, oftentimes, though, when it comes to large patients, like we have a lot of them in the United States, uh, 120 kVp just doesn't have the penetrating power. So that will be interesting to see how it works uh, within the rest of the world. I'm not sure how well that would work in the United States. He did say that the tube is capable of getting to 240 kVp. That would be the kind of strength that, that you would use for x-ray shipping containers or uh, industrial purposes. And uh, I don't know if that's exactly this tube uh, versus him saying the technology is capable of getting to 240 kVp. All right, we're going to finish then. We'll wait to see what they have to say at the Jeffries Healthcare Conference for tomorrow. Again, 10 a.m. Eastern Time. Until next time, enjoy your investing.